Well, if you've got a Bible, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. You know, um, there are a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about the seriousness and the weight that is put on the teacher, on the preacher of God's word. And, and uh, um, the Bible warns um, that, uh, that there will be many who will come along to preach and to teach the Bible um, that will... Um, will preach for their own purposes, that will teach for their own purposes. They will, whether that be for financial gain or uh, even use the Bible <clears throat> to manipulate people uh, into um, to supporting their own selfish and perverted desires. Um, and so James tells us in James chapter 3, um, James says that the not many of you should become teachers. That um, he says, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And then Jesus would say this. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones or one of these, um, he's talking about young um, followers of Jesus, young believers. Um, whoever, would, whoever would cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. That to open up the Bible and to say to someone, this is what the Bible is teaching, that it is a weighty and, uh, and honestly terrifying, um, uh, and it certainly is it, it's not lost on me. Um, this, this is why I feel the weight. Um, like every, every time about Saturday afternoon going into evening rolls around, I get this just kind of uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach because I'm, I'm beginning to think about what's getting ready to happen. That I'm going to be standing in front of you, opening up the Bible and teaching these things to you. Um, this, that's the weight that falls on the preacher, the weight that falls on the teacher. And, it's, and it is a good weight. It is, it is good and right. Um, that any preacher, teacher of the word should feel that. But the passage that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks um, is not about the weight that falls on the preacher, but the weight that falls on you, the weight that falls on the listener. This is about you. Jesus is going to say when the teaching of God's word goes out, it lands on people in, in different ways. And, uh, and so here's, here, we'll pick it up in verse, uh, in, in verse 1 in chapter 13. Here's what he says. He says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered around about him, and so that he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. Now, a parable is a name for a story that Jesus would tell that would carry some sort of deeper, significant meaning. Um, Jesus would oftentimes, he would often tell stories in his teaching, in his, in his preaching. And, and it wasn't simply to illustrate a point but he, or to make something simple for the audience to understand what he was saying. Actually, Jesus is going to say, he goes on in, uh, in, the, in the next part in verse, in verse 10 and, and and somebody asked him, why are you teaching like this? Why, why are you telling us these parables? Why are you sharing these stories with us? And, and Jesus tells us, he, he says the reason that he does what, he's, what he's, he's going to tell these stories and he, he uses these parables is because he knows, some, he knows that there are some in the crowd who don't want to hear it. And there are some who do. And he says that by teaching in parables, those that don't want to hear it, they're going to miss it. And those that do, that do want to hear it, it reveals the truth. It reveals the truth of what he's saying to them. And, and in other words, Jesus is doing something really intentional. That these are not cute, just cute little stories about farmers and sheep and seeds. That these were actually revolutionary stories that Jesus was telling. Listen, two years from this moment, two years from this moment in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is going to be killed by the Romans. He's going to be put to death by the Romans. Ro Listen, Rome doesn't kill people who tell cute little stories that you pass on to your grandkids. Rome goes after guys who, sits on, who sit on boats and tell stories that causes crowds of people to shift their allegiance from Rome into the kingdom of God. Th this is what's going on. All of these stories that Jesus is going to tell in Matthew 13 are about the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God. And every time, every time Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, what he is doing is he is calling people to shift their allegiance, th to live for something other than what they're living for right now, to shift their allegiance away from Caesar and, into, and onto to Jesus. 
The, the Roman Empire would, would if, if you don't know, the Roman Empire would hold one of the tactics that they would use to hold the allegiance of the people that, uh, in, the, in the empire is to, they would, offer, they would give them bread. They would provide for them bread. They, 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 they look, we're, we're taking care of you. So, and it would hold the allegiance. Like, like Rome is feeding me. Rome is giving my family what we, what we need. It is serving us what we need. And so it would give them bread to hold on to their allegiance. And one day Jesus is on a mountain and he's with thousands of people listening to him. And, and uh, all of a sudden these people out on the mountain, they've been out there all day and they're hungry. And Jesus goes, oh, you want bread? You want bread? And he calls over a little boy and he says, bring your lunch with you. And he takes this little boy's lunch, and he feeds thousands of people bread. That's not a cute little story. That's not just a story we slap on a flannel graph to tell our kids. That's a story that gets Jesus killed. Thousands of people are gathering around Jesus, and he starts telling them stories about another kingdom, that there's the reign and the rule of Caesar, There's the kingdom of this earth, and then there's the reign and the rule of God, the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus calls for them to give their allegiance to the kingdom of heaven. And thousands of people begin to follow Jesus. This isn't cute. This isn't nice. This is revolutionary. Jesus is a rebel, and he is calling people to abandon what they know, to abandon what they've been told about the empire, about what life is about, and where their loyalty lies, that there's something better, there's something greater, there's, so, there's, there's another kingdom that you should give your life to. But here's the thing. I'm afraid that what we have done is that we have We have dwindled Christianity down to a nice, safe, positive, and encouraging Caleb kind of life where it's all cleaned up, it's moral, it's it's conservative, and the Bible comes along and and, and says "That that is not what this is. Christianity following Jesus is revolutionary. It's subversive that it blows up the empire. It blows up the American dream. That there's actually something better than having a nice job and a nice family and a nice, in a, in a nice house and a nice neighborhood. So when we come in here and we gather like this, what are we doing but making a statement? We're making a statement that I am broken, that I cannot depend on myself, that I cannot fix myself, that I want my allegiance to be for something more than the kingdom of this world. I want my money to be leveraged for something better, for something greater, something more than what this culture says that I should spend, I should spend my money on. I want my sexuality, I want my marriage to be countercultural, not what my culture, not what this world would tell me how those things should go because it doesn't work. Now, to gather like this is to say the kingdom of this world cannot give me what I need. I need something bigger. I need something better. I need something more. There's something beyond what this world can give. I need God to intervene. I need the kingdom of God. I need the grace of God. So I I want to set these next few weeks up by saying when Jesus is telling these parables, these are not nice, cute little stories that Jesus is telling, saying, I hope, you know, just to try to clarify some things for us. These are meant to turn everything upside down in the way that you have been wired to think about the world in your life. So Jesus, he, he starts off with this story about these, this sower and these soils that planting these, these seeds. And he, he says this in verse three, he told them many things in parables saying his sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some feeds fell, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, he's not talking about physical ears there, right? Like, he's not just wondering, like, if, if, you, if you just happen to have some ears on you, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what my wife tells me from time to time when she says, you're not listening to me. And I go, yeah, I heard every word. You said this, 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 and she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not listening. That's what Jesus is saying here. 
This is Jesus going, when the word of God goes out, there are some who hear and there are some who listen. There are some who hear and there are some who listen. So he's going to explain what this whole story was about. He gets into this section and says, here's why I'm telling parables. And then he goes, comes back to this parable that he told and says, here, let me tell you what this was all about. So we pick it up in verse 18. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So Jesus is going, every time the word goes out, it's landing in different ways. Every time the word goes out, like even right now, even right now in this moment, it has a softening effect or it has a hardening effect. It either hardens a heart or it softens a heart. It's why someone will say to me, um, hey, thank you for that message. That's exactly what I needed to hear. And then on the same day, I'll get a note that says, hey, thank you for not preaching so long. And that's a true story, unfortunately. How does that happen? How does that happen in the same day? The same word goes out because the word goes out and for some it works and it softens and changes things and for others it's rejected. It's the same word. It's the same word, two responses. The word goes out and it lands on different soil and Jesus is saying here that some land on hard hearts that it never went below the surface, and so it just gets snatched up. And listen, let's just, be, let's just call it for what it is. That's some of you here. That you want nothing to do with it. That as far as you're concerned, we're just filling time. You don't have any intention on doing anything with what you, with what you hear from the Word today. Some of you, 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 don't, you don't really believe the Bible. You're not really sure what you believe about Jesus. You have too many unanswered questions. There's, there's too much evil in the world. The Bible just seems to be too irrelevant for your life experience. The Word has landed on a hard heart, and I don't care what you say. I'm not planning on doing anything with this. But that's not the only way the word, the word lands on our hard heart. In fact, most of the time, this is how I see this happening. It's those who are so familiar with all of this that you can quote scripture, you can have a favorite Bible verse, you can have a favorite Christian song or hymn, and you perhaps have explained the scripture to somebody else. Maybe you've taught the scripture to somebody else. But it never gets past your head. It never has made its way into your heart. At the word of God, the gospel, it just doesn't, it doesn't move you. You, you know all the things. You, you, you perhaps have all of your theology all buttoned up, and you can argue with the best of them, but it's nothing more than knowledge. You've never had the moment where you're going, man, I just never saw that about myself. In light of what God is, God's word is saying, I see my life differently. In light of the gospel, I am now broken over my sin, or I'm rejoicing in how God is changing me, making me more like Jesus. He's making me more compassionate, more broken for the, lo the lost. That doesn't happen where the word of God lands on a hard heart, that it just never gets past your head. And never gets past just something that you know. And it's, if, it's, if that's you today, it's my hope that you would pray, God, help me to see the way you see. Help me to understand. Or perhaps it's the prayer that you need to pray, God, if you exist, I want to know. And in doing so, it's my prayer that your heart would be softened, that you would come to the place where you say, I believe this. And not only do I believe it, I want it. I want this. Jesus goes on and he, he says, As for the one that was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. He receives it with joy. Jesus is describing here the shallow heart. And, and this is terrifying. This is someone who says, no, I want it. I, and and, I, and I, I believe it. He says, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This is just a truth that not many people want to hear. But this is the one who can look back at an event in your life. You can look back at a moment in your life, at a, maybe a church service in your life, and you pray to prayer. 
you prayed this prayer, you, or you walked down an aisle, or you got baptized, and you said, you said yes to Jesus, and, 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 but you have not grown in your love for Jesus. Like there was like this short period of time, there's this emotional experience But you have not grown in your love for Jesus. You've not grown in your worship of Jesus. You've not grown in your pursuit of Jesus. You have nothing but a moment, an emotion that you cling to. That maybe as a kid or as a teenager, you were in that class or you were at that camp and someone said, hey, you don't want to go to hell, do you? Like you want to go to to heaven with mommy and daddy, right? And you're going, "Uh, yeah. Well, then you need to ask Jesus in your heart. And you'd be like, and you were like, well, I'd ask the marshmallow man in my heart if that's what it took, right? Because I don't want to go to heaven, or I don't want to go to hell. And so, and so you just, and so they had you pray some magic, and just repeat after me, and just say, say these magic words. It's this magical prayer, and then you got baptized. And through the years, you may have learned to be a good, moral, church-going person, but you have not been transformed by the Holy Spirit. There has never been real repentance. No root has taken hold in your life. And then something comes along in your life, job stuff, family stuff, marriage stuff, somebody gets sick. All of a sudden, your friends start leaving you out of certain things, and you turn your your back on Christianity, and you walk away. Because, hey, what use is Christianity if it doesn't give me the things that I want? Like, what what use is Christianity? I mean, this is why you hear people say, yeah, I tried Christianity once. It just didn't work for me. What is that? That's because for them, Christianity wasn't about transferring your allegiance to Jesus and his kingdom. It was about getting Jesus to enter into their kingdom, to fulfill their plan for their life. To them, Jesus wasn't supposed to be their king. He was supposed to be their their service provider. And listen, if that's you today, and I believe there are many that are that way. Listen, if that's you today, I don't don't mean to be unkind, but you just need to know that Jesus didn't come to be your sugar daddy. He came to be king. And if that lands on you this morning, you're going, listen, I, that, that's me. Like I had some experience. I had a moment where I thought I became a Christian, but then that thing hit me. That trial hit or that, that, that hard season came with my health, health with, or with somebody that I love or that, the, you know, that persecution came my way and I just walked away. And it's not that you had it and then you lost it. What Jesus just said is it was never there to begin with. Listen, if that's you, what I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you to pay attention to what it is that caused you to walk away. Like, what was it? What was that thing that caused you to walk away? What was it that you lost? What, what was, it, was, it a, was it a friendship? Was it, a, uh, was it, was it your health? What was it that you lost? What was it that that was the thing that said, oh, I lost that, I'm done with Jesus, I'm done with Christianity. Pay attention to whatever that is because whatever that is, that's the thing that you worship. That's the thing that you, you hold on to and you're worshiping. If that's, whatever it is that said, no, 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 that's the final straw because I will not give that up, that is not okay. Pay attention because that, listen, everybody worships something. If you're not worshiping Jesus, you're worshiping something. The word goes out, and it lands on some with a shallow heart. And there are, listen, there are a lot of people who are here. But perhaps most people are in what Jesus describes next in verse 22. He says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is the divided heart. This is someone who says, I believe it. I I, I want it. But then there is no living this out. There is no obedience. I, I, I want Jesus to forgive me for sure. I want him to take me to heaven absolutely. But I want to do what I want to do while I'm still living on this earth. I want to call the shots for my life. And when there is no instant gratification or when following Jesus just gets too difficult, it interferes with the way that I want to do relationships, the way that I want to spend my money, what I want to do on the weekend, then I'm out. As if God is the enemy of your joy. As if God is the enemy of pleasures and riches. 
And so they will trade peace with God for money and immediate pleasure. Do you know that Jesus, Jesus said that money is a part of your discipleship? It's part of your discipleship. That where your treasure goes, your heart will follow. Listen, I, I know we all get offended when someone you know, brings up money in church, which if, if we're honest, is just a pretty good indicator of what's going on in our hearts and how tightly money has gripped our hearts. And so what's the issue here? The issue is faith. We don't, we don't trust God with what he gives us, even though he says, you don't, you don't trust me? You don't trust that I'm going to take care of you? You don't trust I'm going to provide for you? Then, then, he, sa- then he says, then test me. And see if I will not pour out blessings on you that you cannot contain. The hard thing about the divided heart is you cannot see this in the mirror. But the number one competitor for your heart will be your money. And Jesus says to us in the crowd standing there that our relationship with our stuff is revealing the authenticity of our faith. That our money betrays us. That we might say one thing and yet our money reveals something else. Is here's the thing about what Jesus is saying here. The, the, the first two, the first two, it's is pretty clear that they never were Christians. But this one, it's hard to tell. They would say that they're committed to Christ, yet they don't want to give up control of their lives. They have a divided heart. They don't see their life changing. They don't see the power of God working in their life. So they're always anxious, they're always, they're always in doubt, because though they would say that Jesus is king, the reality is they are the ones that are ruling their own life. And for example, you, you may be someone who says, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm committed to Christ, and yet you use your sexuality in ways that seem pleasing to you, but you know is wrong. And you're just not willing to give that up. And you're not going, no, it's not that I don't believe in Jesus. It's not that I'm not a follower of Jesus. It's not that I'm not committed to Jesus. I'm just not willing to let this go. This, as far as this goes, I, I, I call the shots when it comes to my sexuality. And yet you wonder why you're so unhappy. It's because you're being torn apart. You have a divided heart. You're miserable because you've let other things take the place of Jesus. And as long as you rule your life, there will be no growth. There will be no fruit. There will be no way that God is using you. And as a, as a part of you, this thought, well, if I, just, if I could just ban- abandon Jesus altogether, then I wouldn't feel this tension. If I could just walk away altogether, but th- then I wouldn't feel like this. But you know that there's something in you that just doesn't let you do that because you've seen too much. You know this is true. And so the psalmist says in 86, this isn't anything new. He says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear your name. I don't want to live with this divided heart. I want my heart to be united. I want you to be the the king, the ruler of my heart, of my life. And then Jesus says, he he gets to the last, the last type of soil, the, 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 the last kind of heart that the word lands on. He says, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another another 60, in another 30. This is someone with an open heart. That you hear the word and you don't excuse, you don't justify your life and you don't play games, you just hear it and you own it, you receive it, and it changes you. You hear it in in an honest, open heart. You go, that's not where I am. I am sinning in that area of my life. I have not given that over to God. I have not been honest in this area. I have not walked with what God has commanded me to walk in. And you repent and you seek out accountability. You seek out help. You seek out counsel, whatever you can to get, you can get that enables you to walk in obedience of what God has commanded. The word lands on an open heart. And as a result, they bear fruit. Things begin to change. 
They get on mission. They love and they serve. And they aren't just nice, you know, cleaned up people. They make a difference. They bring hope to hopeless places. They bring light to the darkness at home, at school, at work, and with, on, the, on the team. They're making Jesus known and they're producing 30, 60, 100 times what has been put into them. This is what I love about what is, what is happening here among us. This, this growing desire to walk in faith and obedience to Jesus, not just simply because I'm just, a, I'm just being an obedient person, but because I just believe Jesus. I believe him. I believe the word of God really is for my good. And I believe in making my life about his glory that I will find the most joy. And I see that happening, and I hear the stories of that happening among us and, and how it is producing, how it is multiplying among us. This, this past week, I've had multiple conversations with people saying, hey, I want my life to count for something. I, I want to give my life to, 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 how can I be used? How can my life be used? And one gentleman saying, I've been praying for a year. Like, God, how would you use my life? How could you use me? And, this, uh, and, 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 and I had another guy going, listen, here's my experience. Here's what God has brought me through. How can, how can God use this for his glory? I love this. This is receiving his word with an open heart, saying, listen, it's not about me. My life, my joy is all wrapped up in Jesus Christ and the glory of God. This is what happens when the word lands on an open heart. I can't stay the way I've been. I want to make a difference. I just want my life to be about making Jesus known. Listen, I, I, and I know where we want to go with this. I know where we, we, hear, we, we hear the word and we believe it and we think we want it, but then we think about our life and we go, well, I don't, I don't know if that's me. I don't know if I'm qualified for this. Are you talking about like pushing back the darkness and, and, you know, and, and, and bringing the hope in hopeless places and being used by God to make his name known? And I, mean, I don't know if I'm qualified. I still got some stuff in my life that needs worked out. Listen, you don't have to have your whole life worked out. And this is the point of what Jesus is saying. It's not how you begin, it's how you end. Listen, anybody can start something, right? Like anybody can start something. Anybody can get married. A lot of people get married, right? You get all jacked up on emotions and caffeine, and before you know it, you're married, right? Like it doesn't take much. Big deal. You got married. What I want to see is, did you make it to the end? Did you make it to, like on your last day, were you standing together? Like I, that's what I want to see. How did you, and again, anybody could start this thing. This is what Jesus is saying. There's a, there's a doctrine that's called the perseverance of the saints. It's not that they started, but that they persevered. That they were, in, they were there in the end. That they believed in the end. That in the end, they were following. In the end, they were trusting. That it wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't perfect, but they were following in the end. This is what happens when the word, uh, the, the word lands on an open heart. It's not just a deeply held belief, but it's, hey, I can't just stay here. The, the word is, is moving me to do something. I want to make a difference. I don't want to be swept up in the kingdom of this world. I want my life to count for something much greater in the world. Listen, this is what Jesus is inviting us into. These stories, they're not cute stories. They're revolutionary. And for generation after generation after generation, there have been men and women and teenagers over the years that took this stuff serious. And here we are today talking about it. And here we are as Jesus is inviting us. He's calling us to move our allegiance from the kingdom of this world to something better, something greater, the kingdom of heaven. And just imagine if this became us. Imagine if we just became convinced of this. Imagine if some of us actually realized that Jesus, was, he has a bigger vision for our lives, something bigger than a nice, comfortable life. And it wasn't that we just attended some gatherings and we shuffled a few things around, but he completely reworks our thinking and we rebel against the kingdom of this world and truly live for the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you, it would change you. And it would change your future. 
And it would change how you view success. It would change how you view suffering. It would, it would change how you view your job, your family, your money. It would change everything for you. And before you even realized it, you would find yourself making a difference. 60 times, 30 times, maybe even 100 times what you received. God, may it be so. God, may you find your word landing on open hearts with your people here at WCNL. Let's pray together.